Our lecture today is called Understanding Youth Substance Use, Key Indicators and Warning Signs. You can advance. So we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of recognizing and preventing youth substance use, the prevalence of, use of, of youth substance use. We'll touch just briefly on the diagnostic criteria to remind everyone what um, a diagnostic uh, di disorder would entail. We'll touch on risk factors for youth substance use and the key indicators and warning signs of substance use among adolescents. Um, next slide. So why does all of this matter so much? Um, we're talking about this because recognizing and preventing substance use amongst our youth is so tremendously important. There's so much at risk and the consequences are immense. Not only do our, our young people suffer immediate consequences, but the lifelong consequences are tremendous. And unfortunately, they're, bec they're becoming more and more deadly. Overdose deaths have risen dramatically in recent years and is now becoming a leading cause of death in the United States. Substance use and abuse in, in youth leads to poor physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional health um, but it all, in adolescence, but it also um, leads to negative consequences into adulthood. This is a time period when these human beings are maturing and learning coping mechanisms that will allow them to lead hopefully healthy, productive lives in, in adulthood. Um, but substances steal that development and can interfere or even halt emotional and intellectual maturation. In addition to the effect on development, the continued use of substances has a major impact on use in adulthood. Currently, the majority of adults who meet criteria for having a substance use disorder started using substances during their teen and adult years. Next slide, please. So the negative consequences of substance use. Substances and the situations in which teens find themselves when looking for substances, um, paying for substances, using substances, these things increase the likelihood of negative consequences in, in their lives. These, these adolescents, teens, kids are exposed to and expose others to traumatic situations, um, violence, domestic violence situations. Um, they become victims and perpetrators of physical, sexual, emotion, emotional, emotional abuse. Finding and getting substances often leads to criminal behaviors and subsequent exposure and introduction to the criminal justice system. Substance use and other mental illness often coexist. In some cases, mental disorders such as anxiety, depression, or schizophrenia may come before an before the addiction. Um, in, other in other cases, substances may trigger or worsen um, already existing mental health conditions, particularly in people with specific vulnerabilities. Some people with disorders like anxiety or depression may use sub substances in an attempt to alleviate psychiatric symptoms, and this only tends to exacerbate uh, disorder psychiatric disorders in the long run, as well as increase the, the risk of developing a full-blown addiction. Substance use leads to increased incidence of infections, such as sexually transmitted infections, HIV, uh, chlamydia, syphilis, which unfortunately is, is making a comeback, um, and other bloodborne pathogens like uh, hep C, hepatitis C. Suicide. So even after controlling for other factors, other um, confounding factors such as depression, uh, suicide is strongly associated with substance use. And of course, substance use in youth leads to adult substance use disorders, which has a very high mor morbidity and mortality in adults. Um, All right, next slide, please. So I just wanted to, we don't have to go through any of this in detail, but I wanted to um, give you a kind of an idea of what it, what you know, what constitutes having a substance use disorder versus, you know, just being exposed to it or trying a substance. Um, so many of you have heard of the DSM-5. It's the um, Diagnostic and Statistical Ma uh, Manual of Mental Disorders. We're currently in the fifth edition, um, and it's what we use, what providers use to make diagnoses. Um, 
there are 11 symptoms for each substance class um, that are used to make a the, the diagnosis of substance use disorder. The, the diagnosis is made along a continuum, so mild, moderate, or severe based on the number and severity of the symptoms from this list. So number one, substance is taken in larger amounts over longer periods than it was intended. Two, there's a persistent desire to cut down. Three, a great, time, a great deal of time is spent looking um, to obtain, use, or recover from substances. Uh, number four, there's a craving or, or desire or urge to use. Uh, number five is recurrent use of the, of the substance resulting in a failure to fulfill obligations. Number six, continued use despite uh, persistent or, re or recurrent social or interpersonal problems caused or exacerbated by the effects of the substance. Number seven is important social, occupational, or recreational activities are given up or reduced because of the use. Uh, number eight, recurrent use in situations in which it's physically hazardous. Number nine, substance use is continued despite knowing or having a persistent or recurrent physical or psychological problem that is likely to have been caused by using. And then number 10 and 11, tolerance and withdrawal. And some of these are different kind of depending on what substance. Um, and there is um, additional criteria in the DSM-5 for that. Next slide, please. So uh, just briefly, some um, just a note about uh, the data that we that I've been using to um, you know, to sort of inform our, our, myself, ourselves about the prevalence of substance use. Um, we are able to get some pretty good data, um, but there are some significant limitations to, you know, the data and the numbers that are collected, such as things like delays in reporting, the accuracy of reporting, um, and biases in both collection and evaluation of, of data. Uh, there are a number of sources um, that collect data on substance use, one of which, um, and the one that I've used here today, um, and I use, I use frequently and recommend is um, called Monitoring the Future. Monitoring the Future is a very large national survey conducted by the University of Michigan. Um, they've been collecting data on, on drug use and substances since the 70s, um, so quite a large uh, amount of data. Um, it's funded by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which is a component of the National Institutes of Health. Um, monitoring the Future survey is given annually to students in 8th, 10th, and 12th grades, um, and they report substance use behaviors over various time periods, such as past 30 days, past 12 months, and um, lifetime. And that's the data that um, I've briefly um, uh, put here uh, in the next few slides. Um, they the, the substances that they collect data on um, includes marijuana, inhalants, hallucinogens, cocaine, heroin, narcotics other than heroin, amphetamines, sedatives, tranquilizers, alcohol, and tobacco. And as time passes and, and new trends develop, um, additional drugs are added to the study's coverage and occasionally ones that fall to very low prevalence levels are removed. <clears throat> These shifts highlight the the dynamic and multidimensional nature of our country's drug problems. All right, uh, next slide, please. All right, impact of COVID. So there are some interesting um, statistical trends related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the pandemic led to some of the most significant changes in substance use that we've seen in, a, in quite a long time. Um, within the first year of the pandemic, uh, monitoring the future recorded some of the largest one-year declines, so decreases um, ever recorded by the survey across a, a wide variety of drugs. Um, whether these declines will persist in the years following the pandemic remain to be seen. Um, the current data that we have is through 2023, and the 2024 data and evaluation of that data is just starting to come out. Um, so we'll see kind of what that shows. Um, but last couple of years has been really interesting. Um, the um, Let's see, the 2023 data 
continue to document stable or declining trends in the use of, of illicit substances among young people. However, um, other research and data shows a dramatic rise in overdose deaths among teens, um, and that has been continuing to increase um, since at least 2010 to 2021, so right up into the pandemic. Um, this remained elevated well into 2022, according to um, NIDA, the um, National Inst Institute on Drug Abuse, um, and the CDC data. The, the increase is largely attributed to fentanyl, um, a potent synthetic opiate, opioid, um, contaminating the supply of, of counterfeit pills that are made to resemble prescription medications. Um, so taken together, these data suggest that drug use is, is not necessarily currently at the moment becoming more common. It may actually be coming. We may actually be making a dent in it and it be, may be coming um, less common, but it is becoming more da dangerous and, and more deadly. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm just going to talk briefly to kind of give people an idea of kind of what the data is showing. So um, alcohol, nicotine, and cannabis use. Um, alcohol use remained stable for 8th and 10th graders, um, with 15% of 8th graders reporting use in the past year and 30% in 10th graders. Um, it's actually declined for 12th graders. It's down to 45%, um, you know, which is still pretty significant, but it's down um, from 51% percent the prior year. Nicotine vaping remained stable as well for eighth graders um, with 11.4 per report percent reporting vape vaping in the past year. Um, and it's actually declined in the older grades um, down from 17 percent uh, down to 17 percent from 20 percent in 10th grade and in 12th grade, it also decreased from 27% to 23%. So pretty significant numbers. Um, cannabis use remained stable for all three grades uh, surveyed. So no significant change there. 8% eighth, 8 of eighth graders, almost 18% of 10th graders and almost 30% of, of 12th graders, 29%. Next slide, please. Other illicit substances and narcotics. So use of other illicit substances other than marijuana also remained stable for all, all three grades. Um, and this was about four and a half percent for eighth graders, five percent of 10th graders and seven percent for 12th um, for 12th graders. And that was reporting any any illicit use, um, any illicit substance other other than marijuana. Um, so these data build on long-term trends documenting low and fairly steady use of illicit substances um, reported among teenagers. Uh, use of narcotics other than heroin um, decreased among 12th graders uh, with 1% reporting use within the past year. Next slide, please. So abstainers. Um, the good news, I think, some good news is that the largest of all of these groups are those who are not using any substances um, at all, including alcohol, nicotine, or tobacco. Um, I think in some circles, it may actually even be becoming cool to be an abstainer. Um, I think it's cool, but I, I guess I'm now considered an old person, so I don't think that that counts. But, you know, you see these new bars in different places or, you know, different social circles where, um, you know, they're made for people specifically who are not wanting to use any sort of substances. So that that's um, that's a really good sign. Um, next slide, please. S so I just wanted to share this. I thought this was really interesting. I, it, none of this is technical, but I put into in you know the AI on Google. Um, uh, I, I googled abstainers, and I, I just wanted to show this. I thought it was interesting. This highlights one reason we probably shouldn't be using the internet to diagnose people. According so, according to AI, those who abstain from substance use are such a minority that Google considered it a, a pathological trait not to use. Um, this, of course, is not true by any means, nor is it even factual, um, as we do see the numbers. Um, do actually show it is more common. Um, but yeah, that's the first thing that came up was that uh, not using substances was pathological. Next slide, please. 
All right, so this just shows the trend for use of any illicit substance in 8th, 10th, and 12th graders since the 80s. Um, you can see the prevalence increases as the teens get older and advance in grades, and you can also see there the very noticeable impact, um, that marked decrease right at the, at the pandemic. Next slide, please. And this graph shows the trend in abstainers when also you can see um, the market increase um, in abstention at the, um, at the start of the pandemic. Next slide, please. <clears throat> All right, so just a note on um, risk and protective factors. Um, there are significant factors that increase the risk of substance use as well as factors that protect our youth against exposure to and initiation of use. Um, I'm not going to read those through, but I wanted to add them for anybody who um, was reviewing the slides um, for later review. Next slide, please. All right, so how are we detecting use in our youth? Um, it can be really difficult, right? Um, it's difficult to tease out abnormal changes at a time when, you know, these are human beings growing and maturing. They're already subject to significant physiological and social changes in their lives. Um, and it's not uncommon for teenagers, adolescents, um, kids to be involved in illicit drug use before they even exhibit signs and symptoms um, of, of use. And though rates have recently declined, um, use is generally more widespread than parents and guardians um, recognize. Go ahead to the next slide, please. All right, so what are some key indicators and warning signs? Things you might see or notice are shifts in mood and personality, behavioral changes, a change in hygiene or appearance, or a change in physical health. Next slide, please. So um, let's see here. Lindsay, did we skip a slide? Yes, maybe. I, oh, sorry. I think I was I was ahead. Um, so shifts in mood and personality, um, things that you might notice. So um, them being sullen, withdrawn or depressed, um, showing less motivation than than, you know, normal or previously being silent, uncommunicative, not wanting to talk about their day, not wanting to talk about their friends, not wanting to talk about what they're thinking about, um, being hostile, angry, or uncooperative, um, you know, seeing, um, you know, an increase in irritability or, um, or anger, being deceitful or secretive. So not wanting to share, you know, names, numbers of friends, not wanting to, to share, you know, texts or other things on their phone, um, wanting to hide things, wanting to keep things secret. Um, you might notice an inability to focus, right? Um, you know, not being able to concentrate on things, sort of being scattered, um, and a sudden loss of inhibitions, um, or being hyperactive or unusually elated. Next slide. So some behavioral changes, um, changing relationships with family members or friends, absenteeism or a loss of interest in school, work or other activities, um, you know, so not having interest in hobbies that used to bring them joy, used to, you know, they used to talk about or, or they used to look forward to, um, things like avoiding eye contact, um, locking their doors, not wanting to, um, you know, spend time or be around uh, family members or caregivers, caretakers, um, disappearing for long periods of time, for a long period of time being, you know, unaccounted for, going out, staying out longer, being, um, you know, past curfew, um, not, you know, staying within uh, the rules of, of time. Um, again, secret of uh, use of their phone, I had mentioned, um, making lots of excuses for behaviors or, uh, you know, missed, missed opportunities, um, trying to cover up smell or, um, you know, things like that on their clothes or their, or their breath, using chewing gum, mints, things like that, um, you know, as a change, if, if they, if that's something that hadn't been, um, you know, normal for them previously. Um, 
using over the uh, over the counter preparations, um, medications to you know eye drops, things like that, um, antihistamines to reduce um, some of the the physical symptoms of of use. So I uh, you know red eyes, nasal irritation, things like that, having problems with money. Um, becoming unusually clumsy, stumbling, lack in coordination, poor balance, things like that. Um, periods of sleeplessness or having high energy um, or periods of um, needing lots of sleep or, or catch up sleep or un unusual periods of sleep. Next slide, please. Hygiene and appearance. So smell, having the smell of smoke or, or other unusual smells on their breath or their clothes, um, hiding clothes, not wanting um, their parents to wash the clothes, um, being messier than usual, having a, a, an abnormal appearance, uh, poor hygiene, um, frequently red or flushed cheeks or face, burns or soot on fingers or lips, um, and of course, if there's any needle use, you will um, have track marks or different things on the skin. You can have rashes or or different things like that, abscesses, um, um, like pick marks, things like that. Um, next slide. And then physical health. Um, so frequently sick, um, frequently reporting or feeling sick, um, unusual being unusually tired or or lethargic, um, unable to speak intelligibly or or a change, you know, a change in how they're speaking, slurring their words or or speaking more quickly than normal. Um, nosebleeds, nosebleeds or abnormally runny noses can be, um, you know, a sign of of inhalation use. Um, sores or spots around the mouth or other areas of the skin. Um, some uh, some substances like the stimulants can cause, um, itching or, or other rashes or, or urges to, to pick the skin. Um, and so that includes things like, like skin abrasions or, or, um, also bruises, Un unusual, uh, dramatic weight loss or weight gain, um, frequent perspiration or, um, seizures or vomiting. Next slide, please. So yeah, um, I I didn't want to sit there and read out the entire lists of all of those, but I, I there really was no other way to go through them without I wasn't going to have you guys read them. So I figured I would just read them. Um, but I think most of those are are self explanatory. Self explanatory. Um, one thing that um, is uh, significant is that there is a very clear and significant relationship between substance use and academic performance. Um, it is unclear which is the cause and which is the effect. Um, it is likely a complex interaction that does reflect other confounding factors, such as the risk factors and the protective factors. Um, here on this slide, um, we see uh, kids who used substances were more likely to have, um, uh, have lower grades, and kids who um, were less likely to use substances were more likely to have higher grades. So this first graph is for students that have ever used marijuana, and it shows that 24% of U.S. high school students with mostly A's had used marijuana only one or more times compared with 66% uh, of students who had mostly D's and F's. Um, the graph on the right shows that only 3% of U.S. high school students with mostly A's had tried marijuana for the first time before the age of 13, compared to 25% of students who had tried marijuana before the age of 13 um, had mostly D's and F's. Um, next slide, please. slide is similar. Um, it shows the percentage of those who took prescription drugs, such as Oxycontin, Percocets, things like that, Ativan, Adderall, um, Xanax. Um, and it shows that 11% of high school students who were mostly getting A's um, had taken prescription drugs compared to 34% of those who were mostly getting D's and F's. So very significant. Next slide, please. All right. So what 
what to do, right? What do we do when we sus um, suspect substance use? I, I, I think that we're going to leave the meat of that to another amazing echo presentation. Um, but I will just mention this. Um, the key to understanding, recognizing, um, and affecting substance use in our kids is talking to them, right? Is engaging them, Um you know, all of those signs and symptoms that I that I had mentioned requires knowing that it's a change, right? That it's a change in their behavior. And so um, it's so important to pay attention, you know, um, and, and talk and talk, engage. Um, they are listening. Um, we need to acquaint ourselves with prevention and treatment programs in the communities. They are becoming increasingly accessible and they work. Um, one such program that offers a huge array of free resources to schools, healthcare providers, and caregivers is this one here I put up. Um, it's called Talk They Hear You Campaign. You can check them out in the references section. Um, there are all kinds of resources that they have um, for um, all sorts of different um, providers, teachers, um, parents, and, um, and that sort of thing. So that's all I have for today. Um, keep doing all the good work that y'all are doing. We really are making progress. We're making difference in our communities. Um, and we just got to keep up, keep up the work. So thanks for listening, everybody. Thank you, Nina. Let's take a pause for any questions or comments that you have uh, for Nina related to our topic. I have a question, Nina, that last resource, do you know of some school districts that have successfully implemented it or what that looks You know, like? I don't, I don't, I don't. That's a good question. Or does anyone else maybe on the call know of implementing that program? Appar you know, apparently it's been going on for quite some time. It's, it's, it's an older program, an older and well-established program. So Nina, I appreciated those slides, you know, with the symptoms sort of outlined. And one of the things as I was listening to you present, I didn't really consider a lot of those physical, um, you know, signs. So I really appreciate, you know, particularly that slide because it helps remind me, you know, there are some actual physical signs too. So the nosebleed and the runny noses, I was like, hmm, okay, going to watch for that. Yeah, I wanted to say I thought it was really interesting that we've only been tracking the number of uh, percentage of kids abstaining for the last five years or so, or maybe it, the, but that's a key part in, I know the prevention programs that I teach is normalizing the kids that aren't using as opposed to, you know, the kids who get all the attention, which are the kids that are using, right? So, um, so that's great to have that data. Thank you.